If the 1997 Berwick Bulldog football season had a theme, it might be the championship that almost wasn't. Late in the season, questions about the eligibility of star offensive tackle Gus Felder were raised. And on the eve of the AAA playoffs, a stunned Berwick found itself declared ineligible by District 2. Upon appeal, the PIAA reversed that decision, and the dogs were back to do what they do best, playing dominating defense and winning Pennsylvania State football championships. Once again, coach George Curry, despite two regular season losses, found the right combination as Berwick captured its unprecedented fourth straight and sixth overall Pennsylvania AAA crown. It wasn't easy as Berwick had to overcome the distracting controversies and several highly talented playoff foes. Despite those formidable obstacles, Curry's dogs hoisted the coveted state title trophy for the fourth time in as many years. After the home opener with H.D. Woodson, the dogs seemed primed for any challenge. Last season, Berwick's late interception return for a touchdown averted disaster in a narrow 26-22 win. This year, the dogs looked in mid-season form in an easy 41-0 win over the visitors from the Washington, D.C. area. Junior punt returner Chris Banyas launched the scoring, returning the season's first punt along the left sideline to give Berwick a 7-0 lead before the Crispin Field regulars had picked their end zone standing positions. Banya's return, one of six punts he'd bring back for scores during the season, caused a knowing grin from Berwick's number one canine fan. And when senior All-State linebacker Jeremiah Dyer separated a Woodson running back from the ball, Berwick cashed in quickly. Quarterback Jeremy Chapin's shovel pass to Kip McCabe was good for six points and a 14-0 lead. Berwick up the score to 22 to nothing by halftime when Chapin sneaked over from the one. In the second half, senior tailback Anthony Melchiri followed blocks by center Ken Lockard and tight end Bill Ferrara on a long touchdown sprint. Even the Zebras seemed to be celebrating the dog's success. Chapin's second touchdown built a 34 to nothing margin. The dog defense, led by seniors Tim Schechterly, Jeremiah Dyer, and Leroy Spencer, kept the Woodson offense hogtied for 48 minutes. In the 1997 matchup, Woodson simply never got a grip on any notions of upsetting Berwick. The Woodson win marked a major milestone for Curry, as the fiery coach won his 300th career game. Curry's 312 wins at season's end kept him as Pennsylvania's all-time winning as coach. The win also was Berwick's 41st straight. But in week two, the dogs found out about life on the other side. No game in recent Berwick history has been more anticipated than the showdown with Ohio power St. Ignatius of Cleveland. The Wildcats brought one of the nation's top prep football programs to Crispin Field. As Berwick fans finally got their wish, in a game USA Today billed as the Super Bowl of high school football. And while some others dubbed it the Clash of the Titans for Berwick, it quickly turned out to be no clash at all. St. Ignatius Southpaw quarterback Dave Ragone's short passing game picked apart the dog defense for 298 yards and three scores as the Cats built an insurmountable 20 to nothing halftime lead. Ragone found his talented receivers over the middle, in the flat, but mostly in the end zone. Defensively, St. Ignatius muzzled the dogs. And when Ragone lined up with Jeff Lerner on a pretty touchdown pass, the Iggy's 27 to nothing lead put the game out of reach for Berwick. Any plans the dogs had to knock off impressive St. Ignatius had fallen flat. 
In week three, the dogs licked their St. Ignatius wounds and pots fell to the tune of 54 to seven, with tailback Cody Hall scoring four touchdowns and gaining 111 yards on the ground. Wilkes-Barre Coughlin, which pushed the dogs into overtime before losing 6-3 in 1996, created no such fireworks in week four of the 97 season. The Crusaders barely had their equipment off the bus before Berwick folded to a 21-0 first quarter lead. Return specialist Chris Banyas stole the show early as he returned first quarter punts 74 and 58 yards for touchdowns. On touchdown number two, key blocks by Brian Hostler and Brandon George sprung the shifty junior. Next, Jeremy Chapin looked left, but threw right to a wide open James Snowell for a three touchdown lead. Thanks to the offensive line play of Gus Felder and Micah Hanna, 255-pound fullback Roy James rumbled into the end zone to up the margin to 28 to nothing. When Brandon George picked off a Crusader pass and waltzed in for a score, Berwick had amassed a 34 to nothing margin before intermission on the way to a 62 to nothing route. After Berwick bumped off Williamsport 36 to seven with 22 straight points in the fourth quarter for win number four, Hazelton traveled along winding route 93 to Crispin Field. It turned out to be an even longer ride home for the outman Cougars. Tailback Cody Hall, who played sparingly during the early season, racked up an impressive 157 yards rushing and two touchdowns on just 11 carries in the game. Guard Micah Hanna's key block sprung Hall for his first score. Seniors Gus Felder and Bill Ferrara led the way on Hall's second touchdown for a 21 to nothing Berwick lead. On the other side of the ball, Berwick's defense, which replaced seven starters from the 96 hit squad, had the opposing quarterback on the run, as the dogs robbed 42 to six, raising their record to five and one. Unbeaten Wyoming Valley West invaded Crispin Field, sporting a gaudy 50 point per game scoring average in week number seven. Led by veteran quarterback Mark Slotek, the Spartans believe this might be their year to unseat the dogs. Defense ruled on this night as both teams had trouble moving the ball. Berwick defensive backs Leroy Spencer and Chris Banyas made big plays. And as always, Berwick's vicious hitting was in evidence. The team slugged it out for four quarters, and with a win on the line, Berwick's Jared Bryson lined up for his second field goal try in regulation. The kick missed, and Valley West had renewed hope as the game moved to overtime. Berwick got first crack. After three running plays failed to pierce the goal line, Bryson lined up for a 29-yarder. The kick sailed wide right, and Valley West was off the hook for the third time. Valley West's three cracks at scoring on the ground also proved futile. On fourth down, soccer player Matt McCormick's dramatic 24-yarder was true, and Valley West celebrated its first win over Berwick since 1986. It also marked the first time Berwick lost the Wyoming Valley Conference crown since joining the league. Week 8 found a bad moon horizon for host Tunkhannock's Men in Black, as there was nothing alien about the way Berwick bounced back from their disappointing loss to Valley West. With Cody Hall providing the firepower, Berwick left the scoring gate early. Minutes later, Hall found enough room off the right side to build a 14 to nothing Berwick lead. Defensively, junior standout J.D. Stanley smothered a Tiger punt. And Hall wasn't finished. 
The steadily improving senior grabbed Jeremy Chapin's pass and cut inside for his third first period score at a 21 to nothing Berwick Bulge. Chris Banius put the game on ice eight minutes before halftime with another sweet punt return. Waiting for blocks by Brian Hostler and Leroy Spencer to make it 28 to nothing. The Berwick regulars rested early in the 42 to nothing shutout. In weeks nine and 10 respectively, Berwick closed out the regular season by pitching two shutouts beating Pittston area 41 to nothing and Lee Heighton 56 to nothing, qualifying for the AAA playoffs in the process. After the Gus Felder situation was settled, Berwick found itself matched up with seven and four Lee Heighton for the second straight week. The dogs thirst for four consecutive titles came into focus. Quarterback Jeremy Chapin had the offense rolling early sneaking over for a seven to nothing dog lead. With four minutes to play in the opening quarter, Lee Hayden made the silly mistake of punting to Chris Banyas, who scooted down the right sideline for the touchdown. Now it was 14 to nothing. Next, Berwick's ground game went to work as Lee Hayden had trouble keeping the dogs at bay. Jeremy Chapin scored easily on a keeper from the 10 yard line for a 28 to nothing lead with just over nine minutes left in the third quarter. Burley 255 pound fullback Roy James showed a nimble touch on a pretty play. And Chapin soon found senior Anthony Melchiori on a short touchdown toss for a 34 to nothing Berwick lead. Defensively, J.D. Stanley and Brian Hostler led the dog demolition crew. Anthony Melchiori added another touchdown as the dogs polished off the Indians 48 to nothing. To win their fourth straight state title, the dogs had to capture their fourth straight District 2 crown. And to do that, they had to go through unbeaten Wyoming area and an unplanned mud bath. The Bulldogs and Warriors, who met last year in the District 2 title game, played a tough, messy first half. As it had the year before, Wyoming area drew first blood, scoring on a long running play for the seven to nothing lead with only two minutes gone. Berwick's receivers, meanwhile, found out that the Warriors could hit two. Finally, Jeremy Chapin lobbed a perfect strike to wide out James Snowell, whose touchdown catch put Berwick's first points on the board. Not to be outdone, the Warriors' B.J. Stellacone's pinpoint touchdown pass gave his team a 14-7 lead just six seconds before halftime. Heading to the locker room, Berwick found itself trailing for only the second time all season. Berwick fans knew the dogs typically get stronger as the game progresses and were all wound up over the possibility. It didn't take long for the dogs to keep their fans faith. Chapin took advantage of a Wyoming area gamble and connected with a wide open Chris Banyas, who was knocked out of bounds at the one. Chapin's keeper in the point after brought the dogs even and poised to take over the game. After the defense held, Chapin strung together completions to Kip McCabe and Cody Hall, setting up the go-ahead score. With the offensive line giving Chapin time, Chris Banyas shook loose and Chapin lofted a strike to the end zone. Berwick fans sensed the momentum had shifted. And when Brian Hostler stopped B.J. Stellicone on a critical fourth down play, the dogs were energized. A few plays later, Cody Hall put the game on ice, breaking loose for a long gainer to the Warrior two. Chapin, who threw for a season high 162 yards, chose the ground to push the lead to 28 to 14 with 731 left to play. Led by Corey Getz, Gus Felder, and Brandon George, 
where we put a quick stop to any Wyoming area comeback hopes. Another undefeated power, Strap Haven, was next on the menu. For its third playoff game, Berwick traveled south to Coatesville to take on District 1 champ and unbeaten Strap Haven. Victims in a 29-2 loss to the Dogs last season. A driving rain didn't dampen the Berwick faithful, but field conditions were a different story. On a natural grass field, Coach Curry described as soft as butter, it was a night for defenses. After a succession of turnovers and punts, Berwick finally mounted what became the game-winning drive. A 17-play, 78-yard clock eater, fueled by a punishing ground game led by Jeremy Chapin. Facing a fourth and two at the Panthers' six, Roy James rumbled into the end zone for a 7-0 Berwick lead. In the second half, the mud deepened and the offenses continued to slosh and stall. Finally, Strathaven got its break. Fielding a low punt snap, Jeremy Chapin's knee touched the turf, and the Panthers were in business at midfield. 3.44 remained on the game clock. Several plays brought Strathaven to the Berwick 15, where the Panthers faced a fourth and one with a minute nine remaining. Strathaven went to their go-to guy, fullback Dan Mulhern, but feisty senior tackle Tim Schechterly and a group of his friends were there to greet the star, stuffing the play and Strathaven's hopes. Berwick celebrated the win and the chance to meet up with another familiar playoff foe for the Eastern AAA title. No two teams have built a more intense playoff rivalry than Berwick and Mannheim Central, which have met five times, including 1997, in the past seven years. The Dogs winning all five. Two of those wins in 1994 and 95 ended on critical Berwick interceptions as the Barons seemed on the verge of victory. Not this year. The Dogs mauled Mannheim early building a 30 to nothing halftime lead in the 37 to nothing shocker. In contrast to its last two games, a sunny, clear afternoon at Wilkes-Barre's Memorial Stadium greeted the dogs. And Berwick wasted little time enjoying the weather, turning up the heat on its first offensive series. Cody Hall's strong running set the stage after a 35-yard touchdown jolt. Mannheim turned the ball over on its next possession on John Spencer's fumble recovery. Nine plays later, Jeremy Chapin followed Gus Felder and Jeff Peters into the end zone for a 13 to nothing lead. After a Mannheim punt, Chapin unloaded downfield to James Snowell, who made a circus catch for a 32-yard gain. On the next play, Roy James, Jason Holloway, Jeff Peters, and Ken Lockard cleared a space that Cody Hall found to his liking. And the senior tailback cruised to a 23-yard touchdown. Chapin's two-point completion to Brandon George pushed the lead to 21 to nothing after one period. With five minutes left in the half, J.D. Stanley forced a fumble pitch and Jeremiah Dyer recovered at the Baron 33. Three plays later, Chapin's keeper picked up the remaining 22 yards for a 28 to nothing lead. The dog defense closed out the second half scoring when J.D. Stanley dropped the Baron's Jason Mamaw for a safety. For the Berwick defense, it was a day of near perfection led by the play of tackles John Ohl and Tim Schechterly and M.J.D. Stanley, the Dogs forced six punts, three fumbles, an interception, and a safety on 11 barren possessions. The Dogs held Mannheim's potent beer offense to 28 yards rushing on 26 carries. When Cody Hall closed out the scoring, 
dog fans were dancing in the seats. For Berwick, only four quarters separated the dogs from their fourth straight AAA crown. We're peaking, it seems to me. I mean, when you're supposed to peak. If the dogs were peaking, unbeaten Western champion Perry Traditional Academy couldn't have been a sterner test. The talented Commodores were positively pumped for their Berwick matchup. Led by stellar quarterback Rod Rutherford, Perry came into the title game as the state's leading scoring machine, averaging 43 points per game. Defensively, the Commodores had posted nine shutouts in 14 games. More than that, Perry was the only team ever to beat Berwick in a AAA final. The Commodores winning a controversial 20-8 game in 1988, the first year of state playoffs. Right from the opening series, Perry showed it was going for the jugular once again. The teams battled even in the first quarter. The big Berwick play coming when J.D. Stanley forced a Perry fumble at the dogs' 12-yard line. And Chris Banius came away with the ball. But after a possession change, Perry showed why it was a threat to score from anywhere at any time. First, Rod Rutherford added to his highlight film reel on two strong runs. The second, a dazzling scramble where he avoided five Berwick tacklers on a 35-yard jaunt. Then, senior running back Chuck Griffey found a gaping hole and Perry was on the board. With 2.50 left in the half, Corey Oaks picked off a Jeremy Chapin pass, returning it 61 yards for a touchdown. Perry led 14 to nothing. Berwick came right back, mounting his first serious offensive threat of the half. Chris Panius beat Corey Oaks to the end zone, and Chapin, avoiding a pass rush, lofted a perfect touchdown pass to bring the score to 14 to seven at the break. In the third quarter, the defenses regained control, especially for Berwick as the dogs dismantled the Perry offensive machine for just two second half first downs. With the clock winding down, J.D. Stanley again stripped Chuck Griffey of the ball, as the talented junior also recovered at the Commodore 37. Berwick's offense began the first of two critical drives. After Chapin connected with James Snowell for key yardage, Cody Hall broke loose to the Perry one-yard line following key blocks from Gus Felder, John Ohl, and Roy James. On the next play, Hall scored easily, and Jared Bryson's extra point tied the score at 14. Perry had one last chance with the ball, but Berwick's defense denied any last-minute heroics by Rutherford and his crew. Perry nearly lost the ball on the ensuing kickoff as the Commodores seemed stunned at the sudden turn of events. John O. roughed up Rutherford on a first down sack. On second down, Berwick nearly picked off Rutherford. And on third and long, Perry decided on a quick kick with Rutherford doing the honors. When the punt rolled dead, the dogs were 51 yards away from a state title with 2.37 to play. After two straight Cody Hall carries, Jeremy Chapin caught the Commodores napping and had clear sailing to the Perry 19. A critical Perry mistake, a late hit out of bounds, moved the ball to the nine. Two straight runs put the ball at the four and senior Jared Bryson lined up for the most important field goal of his life. When the ball sailed cleanly through the uprights for a 17 to 14 win, the dogs had transformed their tumultuous season into another legendary chapter in Berwick's rich football history. Well, I couldn't be more prouder of any football team that I've ever coached because no team has ever gone through what this ball club has gone through. So let's put those losses behind us and we have a chance to win this thing. And let's just get something rolling. Let's just get this snowball rolling again. 
basically that's what we did. We did have a let's show them attitude. We're not going to be denied. 